and talking about standards of where we go, and that's how I would set up a Democratic candidate. Doug Bailey. I don't know whether it's a wish uh, or a prediction. I'm sure it's the former. Uh, I hope it's both. Uh, the winner will be the candidate, if there is only one, who defines what America can and should be in the year 2000 <coughs> and asks for a mandate to get there. That's called leadership. That's what the job is all about, and I think the public knows that. That's it. That's it. That's truth. That's 30 seconds worth. That's all you <laughs> need. God, unbelievable. Well, we've had more than 30 seconds tonight, um, and I want to thank all of the panelists very much for giving the, us the benefit of their wise counsel. Uh, I'm Chris Arditon, a Dean of the Graduate School of Political Management, and I thank you all for coming. For more information on this event, write to the George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management at T409 Academic Center at 801 22nd Street Northwest here in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20052. Coming up next, a speech by MIT professor Noam Chomsky. Monday morning, Roger Simon, columnist with the Baltimore Sun, and M. Stanton Evans, syndicated columnist, are the guests on our Events in the News call-in program. They'll discuss weekend developments in the news and take your calls on a variety of topics. Monday, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up next on C-SPAN, a lecture and discussion by Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He delivered the lecture on Saturday focusing on the New World Order and its impact on Central America and the Middle East. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your patience, and we apologize for those of you who were unable to get seats, and we apologize for those of you who weren't even able to make it in. The lecture will be broadcast on WPFW, and it will also be broadcast on C-SPAN. Uh, I need to mention that there's no eating, drinking, or smoking. Uh, you may smoke out in the hall, however, and if you have a stamp, then you can do that. Um, and first of all, on behalf of the Progressive Student Union, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture. The Progressive Student Union is a multi-issue organization that has been on campus for 11 years. We work on peace and social justice issues, and we emphasize connecting the issues. The Progressive Student Union, as a member of the Progressive Student Network, has the motto of study and struggle. And we think that's precisely what we'd like people to emphasize today. I'd also like to thank a few people and a few organizations who were central to making this event possible. The Georgetown Progressive Student Union and the Washington Peace Center. And please, if you have any time or money, the Washington Peace Center is an organization that's been in Washington, D.C. for almost 28 years. And they have a letter called the Peace Letter, which has all the essential of events, political happenings going on in Washington, D.C. And they've been absolutely pivotal to organizing the many demonstrations that have gone on since their founding. I'd also like to thank the Institute for Policy Studies, who, in addition to the Peace Center and the groups mentioned, um, did some promotional work for us and has been very helpful. Finally, and last but not least, I'd like to thank Mark Pavlik, whose uh, enduring efforts to make this event possible um, have really 
set an example for activists to follow. Uh, the other endorsing organizations that I will name off briefly are the Asia Resource Center, the American University Peace Studies Program, the Georgetown University Palestine Club, DC CISPIS, NISQA, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Guatemala Health Rights Support Network, excuse me, Guatemala Health Rights Support Project, the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, Bix Books, Vertigo Books, Middle East Research Information Project, Young Koreans United, and the Korea Resource Information Center. And all these people have literature and tables outside in the hall, and if you haven't looked at them already, please take a minute. Please take a minute to examine the uh, books from Bix Vertigo and the South End Press table, which is being staffed by Mr. Pavlik. Uh, some of the announcements. On December 5th, the Progressive Student Union will be hosting an event, a panel discussion on Iran-Contra, BCCI, and the October Surprise, connecting all these to Danny Casalero. The, some of the people on the panel will be Jack Calhoun, the Washington correspondent for The Guardian, Bill Hamilton and Nancy Hamilton, who are the owners of a computer software company, which has a very interesting legal history, and Michael Parenti, a uh, well-known political scientist. Uh, Washington, D.C. activists will be gathering for a social on December 6th, and there's information about that available at the Progressive Student Union table out by the elevators. On December 4th, the Progressive Student Union is hosting a movie called Maria's Story, and that's uh, going to be at 7.30, and there's flyers and more information about that available. I have an event from, uh, an announcement from Jewish Committee on the Middle East, uh, that copies of Professor Chomsky's talk today are going to be available through the Jewish Committee on the Middle East. Jake Home uh, is the acronym. Dr. Chomsky is on Jake Home's advisory committee, as are the Jewish professors at over 150 universities all over the country who support the Palestinian right to statehood and major changes in U.S. Middle East policy. VHS copies will be $20, audio cassettes will be $10, and transcripts will be $3. And uh, there'll be more information about that available. And you'll find a flyer on the way out, and please take a minute to examine that. Um, I have an announcement from Guatemala. Human rights conditions have worsened in Guatemala throughout 1991. Seven human rights monitors have been killed in the past year alone. Between January and June, 371 Guatemalans have been murdered. NISQA, the Network in Solidarity with the People of Guatemala, urges everyone at this event to sign the human rights petition, that, and NISQA will present it to the Guatemalan government. See NISQA to sign on. Finally, one announcement from Young Koreans United. They are selling pens bought by a number of uh, labor unions in South Korea to raise funds to cover expenses for their trial. Uh, the workers have been fighting for three years to get, their, get back their wages and severance pay for products, which is uh, uh, products from a U.S. company. Please help the union in their historical fight. This is the first time a third world labor union is taking a multinational corporation to trial. Uh, following the talk, there will be a question and answer period. We ask that you please line up behind the microphone at this, in, in the aisle and that you keep your questions brief and precise. Finally, by way of an introduction, I'd just like to offer a few comments. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that some of the most basic questions about foreign policy are the most important, and yet they are rarely addressed. Today we will look at the New World Order and explore the disturbing answers to some of these questions. In a speech titled, The Challenge of Building Peace, delivered before the United Nations General Assembly on September 23rd, George Bush said the following, The New World Order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. This order gains its mission and shape not from shared interests, but from shared ideals. And the ideals that have spawned new freedoms throughout the world have received their boldest and clearest expression in our great country, the United States. Never before has the world looked more to the American example. Never before have so many millions drawn hope from the American idea. And the reason is simple. Unlike any other nation in the world, as Americans we enjoy profound and mysterious bonds of affection and idealism. We feel our deep connections to community, to families, to our faiths. But what defines this nation? What makes us America is not our ties to a piece of territory or bonds of blood. What makes us America is our allegiance to the idea 
that all people everywhere must be free. The New World Order's prescription for freedom is clearly a blueprint for intervention. The New Republic, in a recent cover story, defined the fundamental law of the New World Order as follows. When the existing international rules, of, rules conflict with basic American values, to hell with the rules. And the corollary, the New World Order should be an assertion of American interests and values in the world, if necessary, asserted unilaterally. Where possible, we should act in concert with others. Where not, we should proceed anyway. We are very fortunate today to have Noam Chomsky of MIT here to offer his unique and penetrating analysis in the true nature of the New World Order. His work has ranged from groundbreaking research in the area of linguistics to a variety of books, including Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Media, Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, The Culture of Terrorism, and two volumes on the political economy of human rights, and many others. He has combined his fearless criticism of U.S. foreign policy with a role as a tireless activist, working with organizations such as the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and the War Resisters League. He has written for numerous publications such as Lives of Our Times and Z Magazine. We in the Progressive Student Union hope today's inquiry will inspire you to become involved with any of the important organizations addressing the terrifying reality of American foreign policy. Please help me in welcoming Noam Chomsky. first struggle today is going to be the struggle against the heat of those television lights. In fact, uh, I'll start believing in the miracles of Japanese technology when they figure out a way to uh, televise without roasting the person who's standing up in front. Uh, the, uh, the announced topic was the New World Order, Central America and the Middle East, uh, which touches quite a few bases. Uh, and the title like that leaves essentially two options. Uh, one option is to speak in general terms about the New World Order, which as far as I'm aware is the Old World Order uh, adapted to changing contingencies as happens all the time. The most important of these changing contingencies have, have, having been about 20 years ago when the post-war uh, international economic system essentially was torn apart and has been reconstructed. Uh, a second option would be to pick some crucial issues, some particular topics, and to use them to illustrate the way the, uh, the general contours of the New World Order, and that means the Old World Order. Uh, and it, thinking about it, it seemed to me that the second tack might be more informative, and in fact almost any current issue could be used uh, because they all illustrate the same essential features uh, of policy, and given U.S. power, uh, U.S. policy has an overriding and often determinative influence, uh, uh, and uh, furthermore, they all illustrate the same aspects of the ideological cover within which policy is presented to us, some examples of which you just heard from our illustrious leader. Uh, the two examples that are listed in the announcement, uh, Central America and the Middle East, are perfectly natural ones. Uh, both regions, Latin America and the Middle East, are covered by what has been the long-standing central doctrine of uh, U.S. policy, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, which says, in effect, that certain regions of the world are U.S. turf. Uh, no one else raises their head. Uh, no foreign entries, certainly, but crucially, no indigenous groups. Uh, and if they do, their heads are cut off. Uh, uh, if they get out of control, as the doves like to put it. The Monroe Doctrine was, of course, devised for the Western Hemisphere in a period of in less ambitious days. Uh, its uh, meaning for the Western Hemisphere was recently clarified in the Gates hearings. Uh, one of maybe the only interesting thing that happened in the Gates hearings, as far as I noticed, was a memorandum uh, that was released uh, in, from December 1984 
in which Gates was addressed from Gates to William Casey, the head of the CIA, uh, on U.S. policy toward Nicaragua. And it opened by saying that we have to start talking tough about Nicaragua. Uh, let's stop the pretenses about uh, preventing arms to El Salvador and all of this other nonsense, which is so easily exposed. Uh, although I should say the media continued to trot it out when it was useful. Uh, and uh, uh, let's talk, we have to start talking tough. And then he said, we have to rid the hemisphere of this regime by any means necessary, any means that we can use up to bombing. Uh, and, uh, that, and he pointed out correctly that if we don't accept this c commitment to rid the hemisphere of anybody we don't like, we will have abandoned the Monroe Doctrine, which confers upon us that right. Well, it was interesting. Actually, the, the day that that appeared, I happened to be talking somewhere in Detroit, and I suggested to the audience that they keep their eyes open to see what the reaction will be to, these, to this memorandum, predicting that there would be a null reaction. And in fact, that's true. It never came up in Congress. The media didn't mention it. It wasn't considered one of the big issues. And that's exactly correct, because essentially everyone agrees across the spectrum, it's agreed that we have a right to rid the hemisphere, or for that matter, the world, uh, of anybody we don't like by any means that we, uh, that we find feasible and uh, possible, and that he is quite right in saying that is the meaning of the Monroe Doctrine. Well, the Monroe Doctrine was extended to various, in this particular sense, meaning we have a right to rid any area of anyone we don't like, uh, if it was extended to large parts of the world after the Second World War, that's just a reflection of the extraordinary power of the U.S. at the time. And in particular, it was extended to the Middle East, uh, which uh, was described by the State Department right after the Second World War as the most important area in the world uh, in the field of foreign investment, uh, as uh, General Eisenhower described it, the strategically most important area in the world because of its enormous energy reserves, which have two crucial features. First of all, whoever has influence and control over them has a considerable amount of leverage in world affairs. And secondly, there's a huge flow of capital uh, that comes from the profits uh, from oil production in the cheapest and most abundant areas. And that has to flow back uh, to prop up the, both the corporations and the general economy of the United States and uh, the country that in internal discussion is called our lieutenant, uh, namely Britain. Uh, added addition to this is our lieutenant, the fashionable word is partner, as Mike Mansfield put it in the Kennedy years. So we have to prop up the economy of our lieutenant and uh, of course ourselves more crucially uh, and control over the uh, uh, energy resources and the profits that flow from them uh, is a major uh, uh, factor in that. That's in fact, discussed in internal declassified secret top planning documents, uh, but it's also very evident in policy. Uh, and we saw examples of that a few months ago. So in other words, Latin America and the Middle East are the, uh, th these are the obvious areas to discuss if you want to consider uh, the, um, the core of American U.S. foreign policy interests. They, both areas reveal to us quite a lot about ourselves uh, the reason is because of our overwhelming influence in Latin America for over a century, in the Middle East for half a century. Uh, and uh, what we find there uh, can uh, tell us a good deal about who we in fact are, uh, a topic which should be of interest to any honest person. Well, discussion of Latin America could uh, open, for example, uh, with a uh, Latin American strategy development workshop in Washington, the Pentagon, uh, just a year ago, uh, which involved noted academic specialists and others, uh, they concluded, I'll just be mostly quotes, they concluded that uh, current relations with Mexico, the Mexican dictatorship, that means it's a rather brutal dictatorship with a democratic cover, uh, current relations with the Mexican dictatorship, they said, are extraordinarily positive that means that they're untroubled by such trivialities as stolen elections, death squads, endemic torture, scandalous treatment of workers and peasants, uh, ecological destruction in the interests of private power, uh, and so on. But uh, they said that everything is not rosy. There's some problems on the horizon. Uh, 
And the main, the only problem they note is, I'll quote, a democracy opening in Mexico could test the special relationship by bringing into office a government more interested in challenging the United States on economic and nationalist grounds. So right now everything's fine because it's just a brutal di and uh, murderous dictatorship. But if there's a democracy opening, we may have some problems uh, because a democracy opening might mean that uh, various popular interests might be reflected uh, and that would be harmful uh, to uh, the U.S. concern, uh, which is, of course, investment opportunities and uh, the local wealthy classes and so on. Well, that hits the nail on the head. Uh, the primary concern of the United States in the third world has, in fact, always, uh, has been the problem of meaningful democracy, uh, which is, in fact, a threat to power and privilege. And that has to be crushed. It has to be crushed abroad, and it has to be crushed at home. And without understanding that, uh, you understand very little about domestic or foreign affairs uh, and, or about American society and culture. Now, of course, the methods for crushing democratic forces abroad and at home are different. Abroad, you can do it pretty much in the way it's done by totalitarian states. You can use violence, in fact, unrestricted violence. At home, uh, over centuries of popular struggle, the capacity of the state to coerce and control has been limited, so a whole variety of other devices have been needed, but it's been well understood, and it's a major theme of uh, intellectual discourse, if you like, for centuries, that methods have to be found to control and divert what used to be called the rascal multitude uh, and to keep them from interfering in what is none of their business, uh, namely the management of public affairs. As Walter Lippmann put it, uh, the elements that rule have to be protected from meddling and ignorant outsiders, that is, the mass of the population, and if you can't do it by force, you do it by other means. Well, a few weeks after this uh, report on our extraordinary, uh, on the extraordinarily positive relations with uh, the Mexican tyranny, a leading journal in Mexico published an article by a, uh, a reporting on a conference in Mexico, a uh, conference on uh, <coughs> international traffic of children, minors. Uh, the report quotes uh, a leading researcher at the National University, the Autonomous University in Mexico from the Institute for Law Research, uh, who writes that uh, uh, every year 20,000 uh, Mexican children are sent illegally to the United States uh, for the use of, uh, for organ transplants or sexual exploitation uh, or uh, various experimental tests. Uh, the conference report also quotes a report of the United Nations uh, saying that over a million uh, uh, over a million children a year suffer from slavery, um, forced participation in criminal acts, uh, prostitution, uh, organ transplant, uh, sale to rich countries. Uh, well, is any of this true? Uh, the answer to that is nobody really knows, and more importantly, nobody cares, at least nobody important cares. It's not the kind of thing we discuss around here. Uh, but it is uh, the most, uh, whether it's true or not, it may be, it may not be, uh, the interest, an interesting fact about our domains is that this is very widely believed. There's lots and lots of reports uh, like this one from all through Latin America uh, and other parts of the third world domains of the United States, largely of the United States, uh, that report such things. Uh, you can get similar reports from the London Anti-Slavery Society and others. Uh, and whether they're true or not, the fact that they're widely believed alone uh, is a reflection of the reality of life uh, in the areas where our influence uh, has been overwhelming. Uh, this became much worse during the Reagan-Bush years, which was a period of an enormous catastrophe of capitalism uh, throughout the entire world, uh, in the, aside from the state capitalist industrial countries themselves, which in various ways were able to protect themselves from it. Uh, Latin America is a striking example. We might proceed with Latin America uh, by quoting, I'll just pick something that happened to arrive in the mail yesterday, um, a uh, Latin American church journal uh, which uh, has an article from Uruguay by a Uruguayan journalist 
uh, called The War Waged on Latin American Street Kids, which is a translation of it. Uh, and he describes uh, the war, I'll give some quotes, the war being waged against millions of abandoned children uh, throughout Latin America where death squads run by the police and financed by the business sector uh, target and exterminate street kids who are trying to survive as beggars, thieves, prostitutes, drug runners, or cheap factory workers. Uh, some of the victims are gunned down while they're sleeping uh, beneath, below bridges on vacant lots and in doorways. Others are kidnapped, tortured, and killed in remote areas. Uh, in Brazil, where U.S. Uh, influence has been decisive, the takeover, the overthrow of Brazilian democracy was described as the greatest victory for freedom in the mid-20th century by the administration when it took place with no little U.S. support. Uh, the, in Brazil, the bodies of young death squad victims are found in zones outside the metropolitan areas uh, with their hands tied showing signs of torture riddled with bullet holes. Street girls are frequently forced to work as prostitutes. Uh, in one town in the first six months of 1991, a thousand so-called disposable children were assassinated in Guatemala City, another place where we have succeeded in imposing the kind of values we like. Uh, the majority of the 5,000 street kids work as prostitutes. Uh, they are found in, with their ears cut off and their eyes gouged out and so on. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro and San Paulo, reports indicate an average of three children under the age of 18 killed daily by these death squads financed by the business, business communities. Almost all murders have been attributed to those death squads uh, uh, going on. Uh, the journalist points out that this is a region where 183 million people live in abject poverty, so that death by violence is only one of the threats for street children. Uh, regional statistics show that every minute, 28 children die from hunger. According to UNICEF, 69 million children survive by doing menial labor, robbing, uh, running drugs, and prostitution. In Ecuador, uh, about 100,000 children from age four up uh, work uh, 10 to 12 hour shifts in one region uh, in western run, mostly U.S. run corporations. Uh, Panama had some, uh, a system for protection of minors, but the minors protective tribunal buildings were bombed during the 1989 U.S. invasion, rendering work there nearly impossible. Following the invasion, the number of criminal gangs uh, robbing uh, stores in search of food increased. Uh, in Peru, 50,000 of the 600,000 children born this year will not survive their first year. Uh, in one Brazilian state on the Bolivian border, approximately 1,000 children work as slaves, extracting tin. Uh, another 2,000 adolescents work as prostitutes, according to union sources. Uh, children work 18 hours a day in water up to their knees and are paid a daily ration of bananas and boiled yucca, reported according to um, labor union reports uh, going on. I won't go on reading it. Uh, he and the journalist ends up saying that until recently, the image of the, image of the abandoned Latin American child uh, was, the, was of a ragged child sleeping in a doorway. Today, the image is of a body lacerated and dumped in a city slum. Well, we may feel proud of our contributions to this picture of capitalist democracy triumphant uh, in the New World Order, and that's what the New World Order is all about, uh, an intensification of the horrors of the Old World Order. Well, instead of continuing through the Latin American horror chamber, which is what it is, uh, I'll turn to the second area, the Middle East, uh, and uh, let me just, there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, to talk about some of our exploits in the Gulf, for example. But instead, uh, let me talk about the topic that's on the front pages right now and has been for the several, last several weeks, the, what's called the Middle East Peace Process, and in particular, the conference in Madrid. Uh, this is not now, I'm not going to be giving, continuing with Latin American atrocity stories, but talking about diplomacy, nice, clean topic, so it won't be so bloody. Uh, the, uh, but let's have a look and see what we can learn about ourselves from that. Well, um, I'm sure you all read the newspapers, and you've noticed that there is universal acclaim for the diplomatic triumph 
of George Bush and James Baker uh, in Madrid. Uh, so let me just remind you of some of the boilerplate. Uh, our heroes, I'll quote now, our heroes exploited the historic window of opportunity opened by their victory in the Gulf to breathe light into on the stalled Middle East peace process, showing remarkable courage and vision. Uh, that happens to come from Anthony Lewis, who is one of the most critical of U.S. government uh, uh, commentators on U.S. government policies anywhere in the mainstream, and it sort of goes from there over to the real accolades. Uh, the uh, <laughs> United States uh, can at last uh, try to bring about its traditional goals of land for peace and territorial compromise and autonomy for the Palestinians in the context of a general peace uh, now that the rejectionists are in disarray and the Russians are no longer causing mischief and the bad guys everywhere know that what we say goes, as the president put it last February. Uh, that's also true in Latin America where what we say goes has been true for a long time with consequences of the kind that I've already indicated. Uh, the news columns turning from, uh, they report with considerable awe that the president is dreaming great dreams of peace and justice uh, and of course marching forward to implement them. That's diplomatic correspondent R.W. Apple in the New York Times. Uh, James Baker is praised for his diplomatic skills and his tenacity uh, in putting together what the Times calls the remarkable tableau in Madrid. Uh, I should, to be accurate, point out that not everyone agrees that the U.S. has really shown itself to be an honest broker. Uh, there are people who claim that Bush and Baker have gone too far in allowing their pro-Arab sympathies uh, to influence what they do. Uh, but it's agreed that, we're, that they're both well on their way to a, um, a well-deserved uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Well, that's sort of standard, uh, but more interesting than this kind of rather standard sort of Stalinist-style rhetoric, it's very reminiscent of the days of the genius Stalin and so on, for those of you who remember that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's kind of standard, but more interesting than that uh, is the fact that similar perceptions, though without the Stalinoid rhetoric, are uh, pretty widespread in substantial parts of Europe, uh, and that's, that's more interesting. Uh, and even, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Europe has to a large extent come to accept the extension of the Monroe Doctrine to the Middle East, which is new, and has also come to accept to a certain extent, the framework of U.S. propaganda. That's also a, a interesting and a uh, uh, noticeable uh, shift. I think it's one worth studying in itself. I think it has to do with the end of the Cold War. Maybe a comment on that later. Uh, but even more interesting than that is that the euphoria is reaching much further, even to uh, towns and villages in uh, the West Bank and Gaza, where expe expectations are apparently running quite high. Uh, the lead journal of the current issue of the Journal of Palestine Studies, uh, the lead article in it is by uh, an advisor to the Palestinian, Jordanian Palestinian delegation at Madrid, Walid Khalidi, who lauds the personal commitment of the President of the United States, I'm quoting, uh, in front of Congress and the whole world to a just and comprehensive settlement. And he's also much impressed by the invigoration of international institutions and the new recognition uh, that we can't go too far with double standards. Uh, in my view, th so that's a pretty broad spectrum. Uh, in my view, this is all total illusion. Uh, uh, I'd like to give some indication of why. Let's just start with a brief comment on the matter of our abandonment of double standards. Uh, by chance, that issue of the Journal of Palestine Studies happened to arrive in my home in the same day that the lead front page story in the newspapers read, uh, U.S. accuses Libya in Pan Am bombing. That's 270 people killed. And the subheading read, retaliation weighed, says White House. And the editorials issued stern calls for just punishment, uh, overflowing with self-righteousness. Uh, the news reports told us that this fiendish act of wickedness 
uh, had become the horrific symbol of terrorism, quoting the New York Times. Uh, again, it was not entirely uniform. So the New York Times ran an op-ed pointing out that the evidence about Libya was pretty thin and suggesting some government duplicity in identifying Libya. Uh, the uh, authors uh, accused the government of letting, uh, letting the Palestinians off the hook at a sensitive moment in the peace conference, uh, and also uh, they charged that Syria and Iran had been let off the hook for similar reasons. Uh, the, the authors of uh, this article representing the dissidents are Robert and Tamara Kupperman. Robert Kupperman is a leading proponent of what's called low-intensity conflict, uh, author of manuals on how to implement it efficiently, manuals in which he defines low-intensity conflict. Here's the definition. Uh, it's the threat or use of force to achieve political objectives without the full-scale commitment of resources. Uh, that's to be distinguished from international terrorism, which is defined in U.S. Army manuals as the use, the threat or use of force to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature. Uh, in short, uh, low-intensity conflict is international terrorism, uh, as the uh, advocates and practitioners of it are kind enough to inform us in their, uh, not only in their definitions, but also in, in the practice. So we have a spectrum, then, ranging from those who assumed that the government case against Libya was proven on the obvious grounds that it had been proclaimed, uh, and then on the other extreme, we had skeptics who are leading proponents of international terrorism and think that the case hasn't quite yet been proven and we should go after other favored enemies uh, like Palestinians. So the issue is, uh, should we mete out stern justice to Libya alone or also to other official enemies and should we use bombing or maybe some other technique? Well, uh, that's what's known as an independent press in a free society. Uh, now, there were some things that were not discussed, at least I didn't see them discussed. Uh, for example, one thing not discussed was the worst air tragedy uh, of uh, the decade. Uh, that was an air uh, bombing of an Air India plane uh, in 1985, which killed 329 people. There's a book by Leslie and Andrew Coburn called Out of Control, uh, which discusses some of the background for this. Uh, apparently, the Two people who bombed it were trained in a paramilitary training camp in Alabama. Uh, this was supposedly a sting operation that went out of control. Uh, the fact that the U.S. had been involved in training the people who bombed it was acknowledged a couple of months later by the Attorney General Edwin Meese in India, who sort of promised the Indians we'd be careful to see that that doesn't happen again. Uh, but that was not a horrific symbol of international terrorism, and you don't have huge squads of thousands of people you know, scouring the region to see what uh, sensors you can discover, and so on and so forth. Now, that one I didn't see mentioned, though it's the worst air tragedy of the decade. Uh, there was some mention of another air tragedy, the downing of an Iranian commercial jet with 290 people killed. That's also more than the uh, most horrific symbol of terrorism of the decade. Uh, that was described, for example, by the, uh, uh, the Middle East correspondent of the Boston Globe, Mary Curtius, as, as she put it, the accidental downing of the Iranian passenger plane by the USS Vincennes, uh, which, has, which was part of the naval armada that had been sent by George Bush to help out his pal Saddam Hussein uh, in the Iran-Iraq war. And in fact, the shooting down of this plane was a rather decisive event in ending the war on uh, U.S. Term, on Iraqi, meaning U.S. terms. Uh, now, a uh, question one might ask is how the news columns, this is news columns, remember, how can they be so, so sure that it was an accidental downing? Well, of course, there's an easy answer to that. Uh, the U.S. did it, and therefore it follows that it was an accidental downing. Just as U.S. international terrorism is laudable, it's low-intensity conflict, a good thing, not terrorism. Uh, however, not everyone agrees. Again, there's a spectrum of opinion. Uh, in this case, for example, one of the people who does not agree is U.S. Navy Commander David Carlson, who was the commander of the vessel right nearby the Vincennes, who wrote an article in the U.S. Naval Institute proceedings uh, 
in which he describes, I'm quoting it now, how he wondered aloud in disbelief uh, as they watched the Vincennes shoot down what was perfectly obviously a commercial airliner, passenger jet, taking off in a commercial corridor. Uh, and he, his assumption is this, this was out of a need to prove the viability of its high-tech missile system. Uh, well, the commander of the Vincennes didn't go completely unpunished. Uh, the president reacted. Uh, he uh, gave him, granted him the Legion of Merit Award, uh, along with the officer in charge of shooting down the commercial airliner, for uh, exceptional, I'm quoting from the citation, exceptionally meritorious conduct and outstanding service, and for the calm and professional atmosphere under his command in the Gulf. Uh, the uh, shooting down of the airliner was not mentioned in the citation, although that's the only known action of the Vincent. Uh, <laughs> the media kept a dutiful silence about this, at least at home, in more civilized parts of the world, like, for example, Malaysia. Uh, third world journals uh, were quite uh, uh, open about reporting the facts, including the Legion of Merit Award, uh, in reviews of U.S. international terrorism, which they don't understand is only low-intensity conflict uh, and accidental. Uh, Libya's response to these charges was a call for a, world, a hearing by the World Court or uh, some other international inquiry, a call that was regarded as reasonable by the Arab League, but was, of course, dismissed here without any discussion as utter nonsense. Uh, that's what's known as invigoration of international institutions, uh, just as uh, what I just described is what's known as the abandonment of the double standard. Well, for those uh, who are willing to consider fact, uh, what I've just mentioned is like a crumb from a mountain of evidence that illustrates uh, uh, what uh, a Salvadoran Jesuit journal recently described as the ominous halo of hypocrisy uh, covering U.S. statements and actions, uh, an ominous hail of halo of hypocrisy that sickens and disgusts any honest person who suffers through the daily output of the commissar culture. That's a major element of the new world order, uh, just as it was a major element of the old world order. Well, uh, let's put that aside and turn to the third feature that the lead article in the journal Palestine Studies finds so encouraging, along with most other opinion, the personal commitment of the president to a just and comprehensive settlement. And let me now review at least what I think is happening. Uh, it seems to me three major questions arise about what's going on right now. Uh, one is, why is it happening now? Why this big diplomatic flurry right now? Uh, two, is there a break with traditional American policy? And three, uh, what about the apparent conflict between the United States and Israel? Uh, well, let me let's start with the first, why right now? And in fact, we might turn back to page one of the Boston Globe. Uh, in that, which has that lead story about the U.S. charges against Libya. That's the lead story, and by accident, or you know, because they got a subversive in the editorial board or something, there's an adjacent story right next to it, uh, which discusses White House concerns over polls that show that George Bush is uh, falling rapidly because of the problems with the domestic economy. Well, could there be a correlation between those facts? Actually, there could be. The story of the past 10 years, the major story of the past 10 years, is a huge assault against the general public, uh, which you're familiar with, uh, huge transfer of resources from large part of the public, large majority of the public, in fact, to wealthy, privileged sectors, investors, and so on. Now, when a state is involved in policies of that kind, it's necessary to divert the public, the ignorant and meddling outsiders, uh, to, to somehow, so they don't pay attention to what's going on around them. Uh, and that's true whether it's a totalitarian state or a, a democratic state. Uh, and there aren't a lot of ways to do this. Uh, two of the ways are uh, to inspire fear of terrible enemies who are about to uh, destroy us, and that's got to be accompanied with awe for our amazing leaders who rise just in time uh, and save us uh, from destruction so that we can once again be standing tall, as Ronald Reagan put it, when 
he succeeded in overcoming the threat to our existence from Grenada, if you can remember <laughs> that far back. Uh, in fact, this is pretty much the story of the last 10 years. Uh, every year or two, there's some you know, fantastic threat to our existence, but then with incredible heroism, our leader somehow beats it down. Uh, and that's a natural concomitant of the social policies that are be carry being carried out domestically. You'd find that in any state, just as another natural concomitant is various devices to set sectors of the uh, targeted populations, the most of the population, set them against each other so they hate each other and so on instead of paying attention to what's going on. This is all pretty standard. Uh, well, it's all particularly important right now uh, for several reasons. Uh, for one thing, the uh, the social and economic catastrophe that uh, resulted from Reagan-Bush programs is getting harder and harder to, you know, kind of put to the side. More and more people see it, uh, and that means that efforts at diversion are needed and rapid and increasing ones. Uh, secondly, there it's also necessary to divert attention away from. Uh, these foreign policy triumphs that have supposedly, uh, you know, shown what great people we are and led to the Bush rhetoric. In fact, every one of them has been a complete catastrophe from the point of view of any human value, at least. That's true of Grenada and Panama uh, and, most strikingly recently, the Gulf. Uh, it's not too pretty to look at the Gulf after our great triumph there uh, and notice a couple hundred thousand corpses, uh, ecological disaster, uh, Saddam Hussein firmly in power, thanks to the support given to him by George Bush and Norman Schwarzkopf, who backed his crushing of the popular rebellions, the Shirt Kurdish and Shiite rebellions. Uh, the, uh, in fact, for once, I should say, got to give the press credit, the, uh, uh, New, the diplomatic, chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, that's a technical term which means State Department spokesman in the New York Times, uh, <laughs> Thomas Friedman, uh, had an accurate description of what happened. He said that uh, right after the, you know, George Bush was out fishing and Norman Schwarzkopf was, you know, patting himself on the back or something, uh, at the time when uh, the, the when Saddam Hussein was sort of authorized to take care of the uh, rascal multitude, uh, uh, the uh, explanation that was given by Friedman expressing the State Department position is that uh, the United States was seeking to restore what he called the best of all worlds, uh, that it, the best of all worlds would be uh, uh, a takeover by some Iraqi generals who would wield the iron fist uh, much as Saddam Hussein did uh, uh, in the period up until his one mistake in life, namely when he stepped on U.S. toes on August 2nd, 1990, uh, as, iron, as uh, wield the iron fist as Saddam Hussein had done much to the satisfaction of the U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, and of course the boss in Washington. Well, that's essentially correct. Uh, uh, it'd be a little embarrassing to just restore Saddam Hussein after the fuss, but we need a clone. We've got to find somebody exactly like him, uh, and surely we don't want to allow anything as dangerous as uh, a democracy opening in the Middle East any more than we want a democracy opening in Latin America, or for that matter, in the United States. Uh, and if the way to block it is by supporting Saddam Hussein's iron fist, well, you know, in the interests of what's called pragmatism, uh, that's what we have to do. Pragmatism is a nice technical term that means doing anything you feel like for your own interests, and therefore we pursue pragmatism, and that overcomes even our high moral commitments to uh, human rights and so on and so forth. Uh, well, so there is a need to divert attention, but still it leaves a kind of a bad taste. I mean, maybe the smart guys understand that this is the right thing to do, but the population, having been aroused to considerable hysteria uh, over the need to destroy the beast of Baghdad, uh, has a kind of a tough time figuring out these subtle points about why we're supporting him while he's massacring everybody in sight. Uh, the, uh, so you got to overcome that somehow. Uh, there also are regional problems. Uh, the Arab tyrannies that lined up in the Gulf Crusade, uh, these are what uh, the British imperialists in their day called the Arab facade that manages uh, the local oil system in the interests of the imperial powers. The British view was that uh, we should veil absorption of the colonies behind constitutional fictions 
such as buffer state or sphere of influence and so on. But of course, as Lord Lloyd George put it, uh, when complimenting the British on blocking a disarmament, an international disarmament agreement, he said, we have to reserve the right to bomb the niggers. That's the sort of bottom line. Uh, so we reserve the right to bomb the niggers, but you got to have this Arab facade out there uh, that you know you sort of pretend they're countries, but they're actually managing the uh, local wealth for you. Uh, and uh, those guys have a problem too. They, those tyrannies, like any tyranny too, has to preserve a certain degree of credibility with population. And if they are exposed as just agents of uh, the United States in restoring the traditional Anglo-American condominium over the wealth of the you know, that lies under the ground in the Arab world. That won't be so good for them, so they need something. Uh, and thirdly, uh, to speak continuing with the urgency of the peace process, so-called, uh, there is, in fact, a window of opportunity. That's not a joke. Uh, it is, in fact, correct. Bush is largely correct in saying that what we say goes, uh, and, in fact, that means that what you see in the Gulf is what we say, because uh, that's what we want. Uh, we have held all the cards. Uh, and now that what we say goes, we can ram through traditional U.S. policies, which takes us to the second point. What are traditional U.S. policies, and is there a break with them? Well, the simple answer to the question, what are U.S. policies, of course, the way in which we're going to you know, get credit for this in the Arab facade is going to get some uh, uh, you know, sort of credibility is by uh, dealing with the festering Palestinian problem. The uh, main, the simple answer to what U.S. traditional policy is, is very straightforward. It has been adamant and inflexible opposition to the peace process. Now, before I continue, I have to make a side comment on uh, political discourse. Uh, every term of political discourse has two meanings. It has a dictionary meaning, and it has what we might call the PC meaning, the politically correct meaning. That is the meaning that's used to adva advance uh, power uh, ends. Uh, and they're always different. So for example, terrorism uh, in the dictionary meaning uh, is what the Army Manual says, the uh, threat, the use, of, use or threat of force to advance political ends. But in the PC meaning of the word, uh, international terrorism is the threat or use of force to implement political ends when it's carried out by others. Uh, not when it's carried out by the United States or client states. Then it has another name. It's called retaliation or uh, uh, defense of freedom or uh, something like that. Uh, the uh, same is true of the term democracy. There's a dictionary meaning in which a state is democratic, society is democratic to the extent that the population has some meaningful way of participating and managing their own affairs. Uh, but then there's the PC meaning in which uh, democracy means the rule by elements that appreciate the transcendent needs of those who own American society and therefore must govern it. Uh, I borrow one of the favorite maxims of the founding fathers. Uh, that's the principle on which the country was founded. And the, only those who understand that uh, are capable of participating in democracy in the PC sense. Well, the same is true with the term peace process. There's a dictionary meaning in which the peace process means something like efforts to advance peace. And then there's the PC meaning uh, in which the peace process refers to whatever the US happens to be doing at the moment. If what the US happens to be doing at the moment is undermining the peace process and barring the peace process at every turn, that's the peace process. Actually, it's all quite simple once you understand the rules. The reason for institutions like universities is to teach you the rules. So. Don't forget to do your homework. Uh, but once you figure all this stuff out, you can play the game rather well. Well, uh, breaking the rules and keeping to English uh, instead of PC language, uh, the traditional US policy has been to, has been, as I said, rigid opposition to the peace process. Rigid, inflexible, invariant opposition to the peace process, which is why it never gets anywhere. Uh, you can see this very clearly. Uh, if you f just look at the more or less irrelevant factual record. The record is irrelevant because it's not politically correct. It teaches the wrong lessons. But let's look at it anyway. If you uh, look at the, uh, for example, you could start with the UN General Assembly. Uh, the UN General Assembly has a vote every, they meet every winter, and they have a vote every year on advancing the peace process. 
uh, I won't run through the whole record, but the last one was December 1990, uh, when the vote was 144 to 2, uh, United States and Israel, uh, and that's the way it is all the way back. Uh, it's always something like that, you know, N to 2, where N is everybody who wasn't asleep that day or something like that. Uh, and two is the United States and Israel. Sometimes it varies a little. In 1989, it was 151 to three for completely unexplained reasons. Dominica joined with the United States and Israel. Maybe somebody has some insight into that. But in effect, it's the US and Israel blocking the peace process at the General Assembly. Well, what about the Security Council? Now, notice, incidentally, the United States is a very powerful country. That means when the U.S. vote, if there's a vote at the General Assembly, which is, let's say, 160 to 1 and so on, and things like that happen pretty commonly, if the 1 is the United States, it's vetoed. Uh, that's what it means to be in a position to be able to assert what we say goes. Uh, the, uh, uh, what about the Security Council? Well, of course, that's out because there the United States can just flat veto everything, uh, as in fact it's been doing since 1976. Uh, in 1976, first major U.S. veto, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, there was a resolution which called for, I'll quote it, uh, uh, a uh, settlement, a peace settlement on the pre-1967 borders, Arab-Israeli settlement, that means the internationally recognized borders, with guarantees for the sovereignty, ter territorial integrity, and political dependence of all states in the area and their right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries, including Israel and a new Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, that was put, introduced to the Security Council by Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. Uh, it was openly, it was backed by virtually the whole world. It was publicly backed by the PLO. According to Israel, um, the current president of Israel, Chaim Herzog, who was then UN ambassador, it was not only backed by the PLO, but actually prepared by the PLO, uh, another example of their terrorist past. Uh, it was vetoed by the United States. It is therefore out of history. Try to find it in records of the peace process or documentary collections and so on. Uh, in short, it's just not politically correct. Uh, there have been uh, the same thing happened in 1980, but in effect the Security Council is ruled out as an agency for advancing the peace process. Uh, the United States, there have been a series of other proposals rejected by the United States, uh, and uh, Israel is opposed to them, many others. I won't run through the record. Now, the U.S. is a very powerful country, so we can block a proposal by just saying no, period. Uh, Israel is less powerful, and therefore they have to be a little more vigorous in their opposition. Uh, so in the case of the 1976 Security Council resolution, while the U.S. just vetoed it, uh, Israel reacted differently. They reacted by bombing Lebanon, uh, killing about 50 people uh, in a uh, raid that was described quite openly and in fact even reported as having no, uh, not a reaction to anything, which was not exactly correct. It was actually retaliation against the United Nations for considering this uh, resolution. And in 1980, when uh, Saudi Arabia announced the so-called FAD plan, which again, sort of along the same lines, most of those plans are along the same lines, uh, Israel reacted, according to the Israeli press, by sending phantoms, which probably means nuclear-armed phantoms, uh, over the oil fields. And the uh, Hebrew press pointed out that uh, foreign intelligence agencies are digging into their files uh, to look up their records on the capacity of Israel to destroy the oil fields, meaning push too far, we, things we can do. Well, that's the way a smaller and weaker country has to respond. Uh, the U.S. is just simpler. We just say no, and that means it's off the agenda and it's out of history, if you have a well-disciplined commissar class, at least. Well, this problem continued through the 1980s. Uh, Yasser Arafat, for example, kept annoying everybody by calling for negotiations with Israel leading to mutual recognition. Uh, this required considerable acrobatics in the uh, uh, doctrinal institutions. Uh, so for example, to take a typical case, uh, the chief, current chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, again, Thomas Friedman, who was Jerusalem correspondent then, uh, he had to do things like, for, say, when if, if headlines in the Israeli press said uh, Arafat offers uh, negotiations, Paris, supposed to be the dove, says no. Uh, there had to be an article by Thomas Friedman a couple of days later saying uh, the Israeli peace movement has never been more distraught. Uh, 
there are no Palestinians to talk to, uh, interview with Shimon Peres saying, if only there were some Palestinians as beautiful as we are, we could settle all of this, but unfortunately they're all terrorists who won't talk to us. Uh, and that routine went on year after year. Uh, the New York Times even refused to publish, not only refused to publish the facts, but even refused to publish letters referring to the facts and occasionally even went as far as writing to correspondents, uh, explaining that they were not going to allow letters on it. Actually, some of those are around. It was all done quite brilliantly. Uh, the result was to craft a version of history which has no relation whatsoever to the facts. Or actually, it has a relation to the facts for the logicians in the audience, the relation of contradiction. But apart from that, it has no relation to the facts. Uh, but uh, does have striking utility for uh, power. Uh, and that was achieved in a manner which would have been be much admired by any totalitarian state. Now, there are reasons for this. There are reasons why the United States has been constantly opposed to the peace process. It has two features that the United States will not accept. One is it calls for an international conference. And remember, the Monroe Doctrine has been extended to the Middle East long ago. It's too important to allow anybody to interfere. That's US turf, nobody's allowed in, so no international conference. Two, uh, every call for um, all F international efforts to advance the peace process uh, have at least a rhetorical commitment, whether anybody believes it or not, but they have some rhetoric about self-determination for the Palestinians, and that's unacceptable to the United States, uh, not because the US has anything particular against the Palestinians, they basically don't exist, uh, but uh, because that would entail Israeli withdrawal from uh, the occupied territories, and it's been US policy that uh, they should essentially maintain continued control over those territories. Uh, so therefore, for those two reasons, the US has always blocked the peace process. Now, turning to Madrid, you'll notice that it overcomes these two defects. It's completely unilateral. Nobody else is allowed in. Actually, to be more precise, Gorbachev was invited in but that's because he is the completely powerless leader of a non-existent state, and therefore he could provide a certain kind of propaganda cover and people could talk about an international conference. But anyone who had even you know, met the minimal condition of existence would not be allowed in. Uh, secondly, uh, you'll notice again that there were no nothing for the Palestinians. In fact, that's built into the very structure of the conference. They are part of a joint uh, Palestinian-Jordanian delegation which is the traditional US policy that there is no independent Palestinian nationalism, hence no, no issue for them to talk about. Uh, and the outcome of both that uh, meeting and any aftermath will be determined by US policy. So going back to that, what is US policy? Well, here you can find out, actually. There's, uh, the US government has been kind enough to inform us. There's a public record. Can't find it in the media, as far as I'm aware, but uh, it's there. You can pull out the documents. Some of it is even in the media occasionally. Uh, the US position was made very clear in fall of 1989 uh, by James Baker uh, with what was then called the Baker Plan. Uh, the Baker Plan then had to do with negotiations between uh, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt with some Palestinians who we like allowed in. Uh, but uh, the, the, and J Baker presented five points. Uh, and the five points were that, uh, you can read them in the State Department bulletin, that uh, uh, one point was directed to the Palestinians. It said that any Palestinians who are permitted in by their overseers, the United States and Israel, will uh, uh, be permitted to discuss one topic, namely implementation of the so-called Shamir plan. And in, car in public statements at the same time, Baker made it clear and explicit that, as he put it, the only plan under consideration is the Shamir plan. There is no other initiative on the table. So we want to find out what US policy is. We turn to the Shamir plan, which is, in fact, the Shamir Paris plan, the coalition plan of the labor Likud government, two major parties in Israel, uh, which had been put forth in May uh, and was now endorsed. Uh, and the Shamir Paris plan has, uh, actually the Shamir Paris Baker plan, has three basic principles. Principle one says there can be, I'm quoting it, there can be no additional Palestinian state, meaning there already is a Palestinian state named Jordan, uh, and if Palestinians and Jordanians and the rest of the world don't agree, that just shows their 
kind of you know anti semites or ignorant arabs or something like that so there's no issue of palestinian self determination there already is a palestinian state that's jordan and there can't be an additional one point number two says there can be no change in the status of the occupied territory then called occupied of the territories meaning gaza strip and west bank except in accordance with the basic guidelines of the government government of israel which bar any form of Palestinian self-determination. Uh, point number three says no PLO, meaning Palestinians can't p pick their own negotiation or representatives even to sign a capitulation. Uh, at point four, there's a fourth point that uh, says uh, there will be what are called free elections uh, run under Israeli military control and you know, if you've ever looked at a television set, you know what that means, uh, with most of the Palestinian national leadership rotting away in prison camps without charges. Those are free elections. Uh, so that's it. That's the Shamir Paris Baker plan. Uh, nothing much has changed. There, sometimes it's called autonomy. That's the current term for it. Uh, in the Israeli press, more honest than here, uh, one of the leading and most respected Israeli journalists, Danny Rubenstein, right in the mainstream and no particular dove, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, described autonomy uh, as the kind of autonomy that exists in a prisoner of war camp where the prisoners are autonomous, I'm quoting it, where the prisoners are autonomous to cook their own meals and run cultural events. Uh, furthermore, he went on to say the autonomy is exactly what the Palestinians have now namely the right to run their own services. And there's a reason for that, he explained. He's pointed out that even the most extreme expansionists, greater Israel enthusiasts, uh, don't call for literal annexation of the territories, because that would have a problem associated with it. It would mean you would have to extend to the territories Israeli law, including the minimal services that are provided for the second-class citizens of Israel itself, the Arab citizens. Uh, and he said that would probably bankrupt the treasury and he estimates would probably double the income in the territories. So it's much more efficient just to have heavy taxation, but to provide nothing in return uh, under autonomy, namely the autonomy of a prison camp. Well, that's what is being offered now, exactly as it was offered at Camp David. That's why it's so praised in the United States. Well, uh, looking back, there's a history to this. Um, somebody stop me if I go on too long, but I'll give a little bit of history. It's worth looking at. Uh, U.S. policy has undergone some changes. From 1967 to 1971, U.S. policy called for, was right in the mainstream. It called for implementation of what was then the international consensus, which meant a political settlement on the internet pre-June 67 borders, uh, with the wording that I just read. That was actually drawn from the resolutions of the time, reiterated in 1976, territorial guarantees and security and right to live in peace and so on and so forth. At that time, there was nothing for the Palestinians, okay? They weren't part of it. It was just a settlement on those borders. Uh, official U.S. policy uh, said that there might be minor territorial adjustments, which would furthermore be mutual. Uh, minor and mutual territorial adjustments, just to fix things up, but that was the position. Uh, in February 1971, a problem arose. Uh, President Sadat of Egypt offered a peace treaty in those terms, virtually identical with the terms of official U.S. policy. Israel rejected it, calling for, looking for bigger, that was under the doves, incidentally, the Labor Party, uh, looking for broader territorial gains. And the United States had to decide whether to pursue its own policy or to change that policy. Now, it was a kind of an internal bureaucratic conflict. Uh, Henry Kissinger won out. He was then national security advisor and pursued his policy, which was what he called stalemate, keep things the way they are, no peace treaty. Uh, Israel responded to Sadat's offer by recognizing it as a genuine peace treaty. The U.S. backed the rejection. That's a big split in change in U.S. policy. Actually, coincidentally, that happens to be the month in which George Bush appeared on the national scene as U.N. ambassador, although he had nothing to do with the policy. Uh, and he probably any more than he does now. But uh, the... Uh, uh, as ever since then, the U.S. policy has been flatly rejectionist uh, and separated from the rest of the world in the manner that I described. Now, from 71 to 73, uh, was, that was a period of, for those of you who know this history, of great triumphalism, both in the U.S. and Israel. The assumption was that Israel had overwhelming military power. You could disregard the Arabs altogether. As the uh, former chief of military intelligence in Israel, Yehoshaphat 
Harkabi, now a dove incidentally, as he put it at the time, war is not the Arabs' game. They don't know which end of the gun to hold, so we can just keep the stalemate. And Kissinger accepted that, so there was no need to respond to Sadat's offers or anything. Now, in October 1973, those illusions were shattered. Turns out they did know which end of the guns to hold. It was a kind of a near thing. Uh, policy had to shift. Uh, Kissinger, who is incidentally no great genius, uh, does understand things like violence. He has a pretty good understanding of that. And he could see that, the Ar that Egypt had it, you know, they, so therefore he had to pay attention to them. Uh, and therefore, U.S. policy shifted, and it shifted in the perfectly natural way. Since Egypt could not simply be dismissed as a basket case, uh, the thing to do was to incorporate it into the U.S. system, that is to accept Sadat's actually long-standing offers to turn Egypt into a U.S. client state and to remove it from the conflict. Uh, there, that's the major Arab military force, and if you remove it from the com conflict, you've essentially eliminated the only Arab deterrent, which means that Israel is then free to continue to pursue the major policies which the U.S. supports and pays for, uh, namely integrating the occupied territories and attacking its northern uh, neighbor, Lebanon. Well, that is the Camp David Agreement. Uh, the Kissinger's dip shuttle diplomacy was culminated in the Camp David Agreement, which had exactly these properties. And that was quite obvious at the time uh, to anyone who was willing to look at the facts without ideological blinkers, and it's incidentally uh, conceded in retrospect. Uh, it's called ironic. Ironic is another one of those technical terms which refers to the uh, predictable consequences of intended U.S. actions which happen to conflict too radically with the professed values. Uh, so that's what's called ironic in the political science literature and so on. Uh, but, and that's a term that applies very broadly to almost everything. Uh, but uh, the, uh, so that was ironic, but as I say, it was obvious to any 10-year-old at the time. Uh, and as I say, it's now conceded. Well, uh, that's exactly what Israel did, of course, with huge U.S. aid. The Carter administration raised aid to the stratosphere so that Israel could, in fact, continue to do this with the Arab deterrent removed. Well, then comes the invasion of Lebanon. Actually, there was one in 78, another in 1982. Its purpose was to destroy the moderates in the PLO. Uh, that was, again, conceded. That's widely conceded and pointed out at the time. I'm conceded, proclaimed in the Israeli literature. Uh, General Harkavi pointed out that this was a war for the West Bank. The problem was PLO moderation. They kept making these annoying uh, demands for negotiations leading to mutual recognition and so on. And that's no good. We want them to go back to terrorism, like shooting down planes and that kind of stuff. Then they're easy to deal with. Uh, the point was actually put rather well by uh, the editor of the New Republic, Martin Peretz, in a uh, speech in, in an interview in Israel right on the eve of the night, right before the 1982 invasion. Uh, he advised Israel, I'm quoting, to administer to the PLO in Lebanon a lasting military defeat that will clarify to the Palestinians in the West Bank that their struggle for an independent state has suffered a setback of many years then the Palestinians will be, turn, be turned into just another crushed nation like the Kurds and the Afghans, and their problems, which are beginning to be boring, will be forgotten. Uh, well, you know, it's possible that, uh, with regard to the Afghans, that if you go to some of the more extreme Stalinist elements in the Communist Party bureaucracy, you could hear similar comments on the Afghans back in those days. Uh, and I should say that Peretz's comments on his attitude toward the Kurds do rather accurately capture U.S. policy toward them, as we've just seen again. Well, that's uh, U.S. policy. It stays like that until the day. Now, there's a spectrum, as always. There are the hawks and the doves, so let's look. According to the hawks, the Palestinians deserve nothing like other crushed nations. And then there's the doves, uh, and here, good example is Thomas Friedman again. Uh, on the occasion of his uh, receipt of the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting in Israel, he had several interviews in the Israeli press, uh, where he advised Israel to run the occupied territories in the manner in which they run South Lebanon. Uh, now, that means under the control of a terrorist mercenary army, uh, which uh, with big prison camps where you hold hundreds of torture chambers, actually, where you hold hundreds of hostages, to ensure that the villages submit to the rule of the terrorist mercenary force 
and you know you bomb beyond the borders when you feel like it and so on. He said that's the proper way to run the occupied territories. However, remember that this is a dove speaking. Uh, so his position is you should give the Palestinians something, right? Uh, and uh, what he actually said is uh, if, uh, he said, if you, uh, uh, if you give, quoting, if you give Ahmed a seat in the bus, he may limit his demands. So you ought to give Ahmed a seat in the bus. Well, you know, again, you could imagine somebody, maybe there's some, you know, Nazi somewhere who's advising the Syrians that they should run what is now Israel uh, the way they run the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, but they should give Jaime a seat in the bus because then maybe he'll limit his demands. That would be the doves. Uh, or maybe somebody's advising South Africa that you should give Sambo a seat in the bus and maybe he'll shut up or something. Well, that's the doves. Uh, so again, there's a spectrum, uh, and we learn a little more about ourselves by looking at it. Well, uh, the uh, uh, the Dove's view, view is that the Palestinians should be given a seat in the bus, uh, namely autonomy, the autonomy of a prison camp, uh, basically what they have now, but nothing more, no citizenship, no independence. Uh, the great achievement of the Madrid conference, and the one that's called forth such raptures in the American press, is that the Palestinian representatives permitted in by the United States have partially agreed to this. Uh, so the news, actually the Israeli lobby is naturally quite enthusiastic. The New York Times the other day has an op-ed by the deputy director of something called the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, which is an organization that journalists go to when they don't want to express their own opinions, but they want their support for Israeli policies expressed for them by an objective outsider. That's a standard journalistic trick. Uh, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy has no other function, as far as I'm aware, than to provide such statements. Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, its deputy director notes, I'm quoting, and that gains were made in Madrid. The Palestinians reversed uh, the 13, their 13-year 13 rejection of autonomy, uh, which was called for in the Camp David Accords, the Accords welcomed by Menachem Begin because they removed the Arab deterrent from the conflict and offered Palestinians the autonomy of a prisoner of war camp, as the mainstream Israeli press points out. Well, the news columns in the US are much impressed by what they call, quoting the New York Times, the Palestinian self-adjustment to the real world, that is, the acceptance of a period of autonomy under Israeli domination, uh, during which Israel can establish the facts of permanent domination uh, with enormous subsidies from U.S. taxpayers. Uh, the idea is that now that Ahmed has limited his demands, he's praised for what is called the new pragmatism, this willingness to accept half a loaf under Israeli domination instead of the all or nothing demands, that's referring to the demands for self-determination in a Palestinian state alongside Israel, a totally absurd idea supported only by the entire world outside the United States and its Israeli client, and therefore, by definition, extremist, rejectionist, and not pragmatic. Pragmatic means self-adjustment to the real world, which is what we say goes. If you do that, then the news columns are willing to welcome you as pragmatic. That's Clyde Haberman, and the same is true of a host of others. I won't bother referring to it. Uh, the, uh, in fact, so much of it that I won't. No, too late to talk about it. But it's standard. Open the press at random, and you'll find similar praise for the new pragmatism. Uh, in, until uh, 1988, just continuing with the history a little bit, uh, the US was quite satisfied with the status quo, as was Israel. Uh, in 1988, the Intifada was beginning to raise some costs, uh, costs for Israel to control it, costs for the US, which, in fact, was becoming something of a laughing stock internationally because of the increasingly desperate insistence that the Palestinians were not repeating magic words produced by uh, uh, George Shultz for them to say. It became a joke, in fact. So the US made the obvious decision to pretend mm -hmm. that the Palestinians had capitulated uh, and impose upon them uh, the US position, say, OK, they accepted our position. There's actually a name for that in the diplomatic literature. It's called the trollop ploy, uh, referring to Trollope, no, this was done by the Kennedy administration, who you remember were big intellectuals, so they referred to things like novels. Uh, and the references to a uh, Trollope novel where the heroine interprets a uh, meaningless gesture by you know, 
the hero or whatever as a, an offer of marriage. So the trick is, if you're really stuck in a diplomatic corner, uh, what you should do if you have enormous power and control over the world information system is pretend that the other guys accepted your demands and then stick them with it and count on the, uh, on the media and the academic scholarship and so on to say, yeah, they capitulated your demands. Uh, and uh, in, in mid-December 1988, George Bush, uh, George Shultz that was at the time, went through this comic act, claimed that Yasser Arafat had said the magic words. In fact, he'd been, as any literate person could see, he was saying exactly what he'd been saying for years. It was just as far from the U.S. demands as ever, and no Palestinian spokesman could ever accept the actual U.S. demands. But now they were stuck with it uh, because George Shultz had said so, and everybody repeated it, so that ended that story. Uh, the U.S. then moved to uh, what, were call what was called a dialogue with the Palestinians. Uh, they were offered a chance to, opportunity to have tea in the master's antechamber, uh, where they were told in the first meeting, uh, transcripts were leaked and published in Israel and, the United, and, and, and Egypt, not here, uh, though they were in English in the Jerusalem Post, so everybody could read them. Uh, the transcripts of the first meeting, the U.S. told Palestinian representatives that uh, you, they should understand two things. One, there would be no international conference, so forget about that. Uh, and two, they should call off the intifada, uh, or what the U.S. described as the riots, uh, which we regard as terrorism against the state of Israel. So in other words, go back to the previous status quo and forget about any political settlement, and then we'll agree to talk to you. Uh, well, this was understood very well within Israel, I should say. Uh, the uh, uh, defense minister, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, of the Dovish Labor Party, had a meeting with Peace Now leaders shortly after the opening of the dialogue, and he told them, don't worry about it, it's quite okay, we're in favor of it. Uh, he said the dialogue is a low-level dialogue, which is completely meaningless, uh, and which will provide us, he said, with a year or more to crush the Intifada by force. And he assured them they will be crushed. Well, that's what happened. Uh, they were crushed. There's a limit to what flesh and blood can endure. Violence works. Uh, the dialogue diverted attention as needed, as intended. Then came along the diplomatic initiative to divert the, Dane, the Bush, the Sh Baker, Paris, Shamir plan, uh, purpose of which was to divert any attempt to implement the real peace process. Uh, that brings us right up till today. Uh, that's, as far as I can see, that's what's happening at Madrid. Well, just last comment, there is a, you know, there's some thinking behind this. There is a strategic conception behind it. It's one which is more or less permanent. You know, it's part of the old world order, the new world order, you know, the next 10 years in the world order, and so on. Uh, the strategic conception about the Middle East is pretty simple. Uh, the major issue there is the energy reserves. Uh, the U.S. has to control them. Nobody else is allowed to interfere. U.S. turf, too important. Uh, there's a method for controlling them. The method is, first of all, to construct an Arab facade, family dictatorships, which sort of manage it for us. Very weak, so we don't have to worry about them, you know, having any funny ideas. Uh, they, uh, the Arab facade has to be protected from the population of the region. Uh, that requires regional enforcers, that's the second part, uh, preferably non-Arab. They have an easier time killing Arabs. So that's Turkey, Iran, Israel, Pakistan provides kind of Praetorian guard for the Saudi elite and so on. It's what Ben-Gurion used to call a periphery pact. So there's this regional enforcer system. And then in the background are the guys with the real muscle, US and Britain, in case things get out of control. That's the system. Uh, and that doesn't change very much. Now, anyone who contributes to this system has some rights. The Arab facade obviously contributes. They manage the oil wealth for us. Uh, the regional enforcers contribute. They have rights. Um, we obviously have rights. In fact, ultimately, the only ones who do, and so do our British lieutenant, as long as they remain a lieutenant. Uh, the, uh, what about the Palestinians? Well, they don't contribute to this system. They don't have wealth. They don't have power. In fact, they're a damn nuisance. They stir up. Uh, uh, Arab nationalism, you know, that is these the pressures for these democratic openings that are always a problem. Uh, so they have a negative value, in fact. Uh, and since they have no, they contribute nothing to our 
domination of the region, it follows by quite simple logic, you know, that they have no human rights whatsoever. That's elementary principles of statecraft. Human rights depend on your contribution to the needs of power and profit. Other, other than that, you know, irrelevant. Well, they don't have any rights. In fact, they probably have negative rights. As I mentioned, they're even a nuisance. Uh, and from that, you can pretty well predict US policy. And in fact, it works pretty well. Remember, this stuff is not quantum physics. You don't have to, have, you don't have to be a big thinker to understand it. Uh, big efforts are made in the academic disciplines and elsewhere to make it look difficult. But in fact, it's all pretty straightforward. And I think, at least to my knowledge, there's almost nothing in international affairs or any of this stuff that, a, again, a literate teenager couldn't figure out in a few minutes. Uh, and that's pretty much the way it works. Uh, and if you understand it, you can see what's going on, and you can usually predict pretty well what's going to happen. Uh, you have to remember to translate politically correct discourse back into English, so you can get out of those problems, but that's not too hard either. Well, uh, that the, the thinking uh, with regard to the Palestinians, the position really has not changed, as far as I'm aware, since about 1948. Uh, at that time, uh, back in 1948, the Joint Chiefs of Staff already recognized Israel. They were impressed by Israel's military victories, and they recognized it as, a, as the second most powerful regional military force and a possible potential base for U.S. power. That relationship then got established in later years that there's no time to discuss. Uh, there was also a discussion of the Palestinians. Uh, the Israeli foreign records show it. Uh, the U.S. didn't talk about them much and didn't care about them. Uh, but the uh, foreign ministry in Israel, Moshe Sharet's foreign ministry, this is incidentally the Doves, uh, pointed out that uh, in their internal records that uh, the Palestinians, uh, they said, uh, will be, uh, they will be crushed, they will be dispersed like human waste and join the most impoverished masses in the Arab world. So there's nothing, no worry about them. Uh, as Martin Peretz put it, they're just another crushed nation like the Kurds. Uh, and therefore, there's nothing much to, we don't have to pay much attention to them. Uh, that's been the policy ever since. Uh, and uh, as I just mentioned, that was uh, Yitzhak Rabin's statement to the Peace Now leaders uh, in February 1989. He assured them that they will be broken. Well, uh, will they be broken? Actually, the answer doesn't lie in the Middle East. It lies in the hands of those who are funding the operation. Uh, there is certainly no hope in uh, the president, any faith in the president's noble intentions or other illusions. Uh, rather, uh, it's necessary to do some other things. First one is to clear away the mountains of rubble that conceal the events of history, not only in this case, but in almost every other one, to view what's happening without any illusions, uh, and to create public pressures that can uh, put an end to the extreme rejectionist policies uh, that the United States has been pursuing virtually alone in the world. Uh, if we're honest, we will also be able to see that this is true in Central America and indeed throughout the subject domains generally, what is euphemistically called the South. Uh, the president is right to a degree when he says what, that what we say goes, uh, what remains to be determined uh, is uh, what we choose to be. Thanks. Um, I just want to know if we had any comments on the October surprise allegations and about the articles that came out in Newsweek and the New Republic about the October surprise. Yeah, discrediting. The question is, do I have any comments about the October surprise allegations? Uh, not particularly. I tell you the honest truth, I haven't really followed it much. Uh, and the reason I haven't followed it much is I just don't think it's all that important, to tell you the truth. I mean, I wouldn't regard it as particularly surprising if the Reagan-Bush administration had tried to figure out a way to uh, uh, make a deal with the Ayatollah Khomeini to hold off on the hostages until they uh, until after the election. However, I think that Khomeini would have done it whether they made any effort or not. Uh, I think that Reagan and Khomeini, you know, the Reagan, uh, Reagan didn't exist, but the people around Reagan and Khomeini probably recognized each other as the kind of folk who can do business with each other. You know, you know they're the kind of guys we like. Uh, they didn't particularly like 
Carter, who wasn't all that different, but had these annoying characteristics of coming out with sermons about human rights and so on, uh, which didn't have a lot of effect in policy, but kind of were irritating. Uh, the Reagan-Bush people were just straight, you know, just straight thugs. Uh, they get along with each other just fine. Uh, and it would have made a lot of sense for, uh, the Iran, for Iran to deal with them rather than Carter. So whether the allegations are true or not, I don't think they would have had a lot of effect on anything that happened. As to their p possible connection to the, uh, nor, nor do I find it in the least surprising that people should try to steal elections. I mean, that's just standard. Everybody tries to do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I don't understand what the, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't understand what the importance of the issue is. If it's supposed to have something to do with the Iran, with the sale of U.S. arms to Iran via Israel, that's almost certainly false because there's a real logical problem there that you have to deal with, quite apart from what the facts may be. So suppose we grant the whole story. Suppose we grant that, you know, William Casey or somebody made a deal with the Ayatollah to hold back on the hostages, uh, and in return, the U.S. was going to send arms to Iran. So let's say we believe that for the sake of argument. Okay, Ayatollah Khomeini holds up his end of the bargain. The hostages are held. Reagan comes in. Uh, uh, now, then, uh, we ask the following question. Why does the U.S. send arms to Iran? I mean, that was the, what it was supposed to explain, but it doesn't explain it. We still have to ask, why did the U.S. send arms to Iran? Was it because they made a promise? You know, they're so honorable that if they made a promise to the Ayatollah Khomeini, they got to live up to it. Well, we can put that one aside. Uh, is it they're afraid that the Ayatollah Khomeini is going to go to the New York Times and say, hey, these guys made a promise and they didn't live up to it? Well, you know, you forget about that one. Uh, in fact, there's no reason why they should have lived up to it. But it's true that they did send arms to Iran via Israel, and this can't be the reason. And just to close the story off, we know the reason. Uh, the reason was explained very clearly 10 years ago uh, by, in the public record, in fact. I actually have a book about it. It came out of it 10 years ago that, quote, you know, had a lot of stuff about it from the public record. Uh, there were no hostages around. It had nothing to do with hostages. Uh, and the story was explained by the top Israeli officials who were involved. Uh, Uri Lubrani, who was the essential amount of the ambassador to Iran, David Kimchi, who was the deputy director of Mossad. In fact, all the guys who later surfaced in the Iran, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the Iran Contra story, which was mostly a cover up. And they explained the reasons straight out, and they were perfectly coherent and standard, and in fact, normal. Uh, they said that where they're sending arms, the U.S. is sending arms to Iran via Israel in order to try to overthrow the regime. Uh, the U.S. didn't particularly like the regime. It wanted to restore, nor did Israel. They wanted to restore something like the Shah. We need an iron fist in the kind of hands we can trust, uh, like generals. Uh, and there's a standard way to overthrow a civilian regime uh, that you don't like, and that is to send arms to the military. I mean, after all, who's going to overthrow the regime? You know, I mean, not civil rights workers. You know. Uh, the people who will overthrow the regime are the military. So you establish contacts with them, and one way to establish contacts is sending arms, and another way is military training, and so on. That's, in fact, the purpose of a lot of the military missions throughout the world, to keep a grip on civilian regimes, so if they get out of in trouble, you know, they don't like to think they have democracy openings or that sort of thing, uh, we can control them. And it's done standardly, almost reflexively, and it often works. Uh, so, for example, when the U.S. overthrew the democratic government in Chile, throughout that whole period where they're trying to overthrow the government, they were arming the military. Uh, when the U.S. was trying to overthrow the Indonesian government back in the early 60s, it was sending arms to the military. And as McNamara later testified that to Congress, he said that paid dividends. Uh, the army actually th overthrew the regime and incidentally slaughtered about half a million people, so everybody was happy about it. Uh, but that's standard, and it appears that uh, that's exactly what was going on in the early 80s. It certainly didn't have anything to do with hostages, because there weren't any. Uh, uh, so it doesn't seem to me that the October Prize would tell you anything, even if it were true. Uh, this is one of the reasons, honestly, to tell you the honest truth, I haven't really pursued it and have no opinion about whether the facts are right or wrong. You know. I have a, that's a while. This is a two-part question, really. One part is that uh, ever since the Second World War, We've basically been told that the uh, 
reason for our large defense expenditures were to counteract the Soviet threat. Now that the Soviet Union has completely capitulated and has gone bankrupt, our defense spending has gone down uh, by infinitesimal amounts. Right. And uh, that seems to me to lead to the question, what was the real purpose of the military buildup since it doesn't seem to diminish when the uh, uh, threat goes away? And uh, there, thereby, what, what are the current reasons for our large expenditures and what can we expect in the future? Tied to that is that now there's a growing awareness on a lot of people's part about the environment and the fact that uh, we're going off the end of the scale in terms of putting pollutants into the atmosphere and into uh, our uh, air, land, and water. And there's a lot of concern on uh, many people's part because of that. And yet, the government resources that are our focus in terms of uh, taking care of problems, in order to tackle that, requires a radical response because we're in a radically new situation in terms of what we're doing to the environment. Uh, in the last 10 years, for instance, we've bankrupted our own government by uh, having our large defense expenditures to, uh, during the Reagan years, which has doubled or tripled the national debt and uh, ends up costing us an interest payments $200 billion a year at this point. Uh, yeah, so what, that, what happens with that in conjunction with our military spending is we're spending half our government budget, part of it for the interest payments for the past military buildup, yeah, okay. part of it for, and uh, so the focus uh, uh, in the World Peace Atlas, yeah. half the world's uh, okay, I think uh, we get people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so two questions. What about the Pentagon budget? Uh, it's perfectly true that people were told for years that it was defend ourselves against the Russians. Uh, but that was about as plausible as the fact that, you know, we have to defend ourselves from, uh, you know, Hispanic narco-terrorists or something else. Uh, of course, that was never the reason, and it was always perfectly obvious that that was never the reason, and the internal record makes it entirely clear that it was the never the reason, uh, and that's exactly why it continues now exactly pretty much the way it did before. The reasons for the military budget were real, and they were significant, and we might as well understand them, that's why they're going to go on. Uh, one reason for the military budget is, is domestic. Uh, every, there isn't any such thing as a capitalist society, and in fact, it couldn't survive for a week. Every society has a powerful state uh, which carries out programs, typically for the benefits of those who own the society, and we do too. Uh, and our state has to funnel resources to the uh, advanced sectors of industry, public resources, uh, so the public, people like you, have to pay the costs of research and development for high-tech industry, and you have to provide a uh, state-guaranteed market for excess production so that advanced sectors of industry can remain competitive. This means like computers and lasers and everything else, and for all kinds of reasons which we could go into. The, me the main mechanism for that in the United States has been the Pentagon system. So that, you know, you look at the history of the development of computers, well, that's the way it works. And, uh, so that, and that remains constant. You know, it doesn't change. By now, they're sort of institutionally embedded. Secondly, the Pentagon system does have a role. Uh, its role is to do what it's always done, namely intervention in the third world. Some, somebody has to make sure that those people don't raise their heads, you know, that they fulfill their service function, the function of providing resources and raw materials and uh, cheap labor and opportunities for investment and export of pollution and so on and so forth. And if they have funny ideas about democracy openings and that kind of thing, somebody has to make sure that you knock those ideas out of their head. And that requires intervention forces and international terrorism called low intensity conflict or some other thing, and economic warfare and various other things. Well, why do we need things like nuclear weapons? Well, the fact is that uh, you know, it takes a, yeah, the US is a global power. That means we're often carrying out intervention in areas where we don't have a conventional force advantage. And you have to make sure you intimidate everybody properly so nobody gets in our way. You know? So you have to have very intimidating military posture. As long as the Russians were, there was, the Russians played a role in this. The Russians were a deterrent. Uh, that's what's, there's a technical term for that too. It's called fighting with one hand behind our backs. Like the Vietnam War was supposed to be, you know, we made this mistake of fighting our, with one hand behind our backs meaning there was always a fear that if you went too far, you might run into the Russians. And they got missiles and nuclear weapons and all that kind of stuff. Another principle of statecraft, if any of you are going into government, is that you never attack anybody who might be able to shoot back. You only attack completely defenseless people, and you want to make sure that you don't run into trouble. So if there is some powerful military force around, you have to fight with one hand behind your back. That's kind of bad. 
uh, and we needed this. And this is completely explicit, incidentally, even in the open public record. So you go back to 19, around 1980, and you look at Carter's Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, or Eugene Rostow of the Reagan administration at the same time, they both pointed out that our strategic nuclear forces provide an umbrella uh, within which, under which, our conventional forces can be used as meaningful instruments of political control. You know, I'll translate it into simple English. If we can intimidate people with a big, threatening military posture, we can use our conventional forces to do the usual thing, intervention and subversion and so on. Uh, and that still remains. In fact, the problem that you mentioned, uh, the, the, the problem of the disappearance of the Russians leads to rhetorical changes in this, uh, and even some technical changes, like weapon systems change a bit. But the problem was, in fact, dealt with in the public record again. Uh, every year in the spring, the White House delivers to Congress something called, I think it's called the National Strategic Survey or some such thing, uh, in which the White House presents to Congress in a glossy booklet in simple language so they understand it, the reasons why we need a much, you know, a huge military force because we're threatened by enemies even greater than before, so therefore we need X, Y, and Z. The bottom line is always the same. Uh, and for a long time, the argument was more or less the same, you know, the Russians, et cetera. Uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, when you couldn't even pretend anymore that the Russians are around, the first uh, of these was produced in March 1990, and it's public record, you can get it, and you read it and you notice that bottom line is the same, you know, we need a huge military force and we need to make sure that the uh, industrial base uh, is, uh, for military expenditures is still there, so don't forget plenty of money for the electronics industry and so on. Uh, and why do we need it? Well, it's not the Russians anymore. You know, you can't conjure them up. Uh, the reason was the growing technological sophistication of third world countries. Uh, and in fact, if you'll notice, we now need Star Wars for that reason. In fact, we need Star Wars because somebody's got to fund the computer industry and produce lasers and so on. Uh, but since the Russians aren't around, we now need Star Wars because of the growing technological sophistication of third world nations. Uh, and uh, since the Russians aren't around, other rhetoric had to change. Uh, and it was interesting to watch it. Uh, the, uh, they, said, they pointed out this is March 1990, you know, while George Bush and Saddam Hussein are still great buddies. Uh, they pointed out that the main problem is going to be the Middle East, uh, where we have to have extensive intervention forces that will be able to move in there in case you know, anybody does funny things. Uh, it's Monroe Doctrine, remember. Uh, and uh, they pointed out that main goal, uh, target of intervention forces will be the Middle East, and then comes the following phrase, where the threats to U.S. interest could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. Okay, so now that the Russians are gone, you can concede what was always obvious. The Russians had nothing to do with it. It was always indigenous threats, just as it is everywhere in the world. Uh, people have these nationalist tendencies, or they try for democratic openings, or, you know, priests organize uh, Bible study groups that begin to lead to peasant associations, all kind of rotten stuff goes on, uh, and you need intervention forces to stop that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now that we can, we have to, you know, the Russians aren't around, we can concede that the threats to our interests were not at the Kremlin's door, but we still need exactly what we needed before. Uh, and in fact, if you take a look, just take a look at what's happened. I mean, again, like I said, it's not very deep. It's pretty trivial. The Berlin Wall fell in 1980, uh, November 1989. A month later, the United States invaded Panama, okay? Restored the 10% white minority, you know, the money launderers, the bankers, and those guys. Uh, uh, eliminated whatever populist elements remained from the Torrijos years, took over control of the military forces, which were out of control. Uh, eliminated any possible threat to U.S. domination of the canal, uh, killed a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand people, you know, nobody cares. Uh, the, uh, 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 it was like a footnote to history, you know, it's so, it's so standard that it doesn't even barely deserves to be mentioned in the historical record. Uh, but there was one innovation. Uh, it was the first time in 70 years that you couldn't say you were defending yourself against the Russians because the Berlin Wall had just fallen. So if you remember, we were defending ourselves against the arch maniac Noriega, who was going to lead hordes of Hispanic uh, drug peddlers to destroy our society. And that game was played for a couple of weeks until it was over, and then everybody forgot about it. 
Uh, in short, it's interesting, Bush is constantly criticized by the media for being kind of inarticulate. You know, he can't formulate the reasons why we're doing things as coherently as it was done before, and that's extremely unfair. We have to be fair to our leaders. I mean, for 70 years, there was a reflex. Anytime you want to smash up somebody in the third world, you scream Russians, okay? So it was easy. Uh, now you can't do that anymore. So we're back to the days when Woodrow Wilson was sending the Marines uh, to Hispaniola and to Mexico in 1916, and there weren't any Russians around. So we were defending ourselves against the Huns or the British or, you know, whoever, you know, the, all the way back to the merciless uh, Indian savages of the Declaration of Independence. We're always defending ourselves from somebody, you know. But the fact of the matter is we're always just securing our own interests, you know, extending them. Uh, and that's what you need a Pentagon system for, as well as the domestic reasons. Uh, try to figure out some other way to keep uh, my institution functioning, MIT, or more significantly, IBM, you know. <laughs> yeah, two quick questions. One is uh, you spoke of the fact that this recent peace conference or whatever foreign policy exploits that the U.S. gets involved in is a diversion or a smokescreen for the, let's say, economic woes that are facing this country. In part, but there also are real reasons like ramming through the traditional rejectionist program, which sure. is not insignificant. But in light of that, how will the U.S. be able to justify the continued uh, aid to Israel and the fact that the issue of $10 billion loan guarantees are coming up for discussion come January 1992. And second of all, um, irrespective of who is responsible for the tragic downing of the Pan Am 103 flight, Libya was the scapegoat for that or is deemed as the perpetrator of that act. Who is the scapegoat for the fact that Israel most recently reaffirmed economic, social, and scientific ties with South Africa um, and was not reprimanded for that. Um, you know, it was glossed over by the media and never to be heard again. Well, there doesn't have to be a scapegoat for that because the U.S. is in favor of it and the media are in favor of it, so you don't need a scapegoat. Uh, as to the $10 billion loan guarantee, oh, I, I never really did get to the third of the three points I was going to talk about. That reminds me. The third was the conflict between the U.S. and Israel, which is mostly about the modalities of rejectionism. It's a trivial one. Uh, on the loan guarantee, uh, the, the way in which it will be done, I mean, you don't have to ask me. Read the newspapers. They're telling you how it's going to be done. Uh, the government and the press are telling you the justification for the $10 billion, for the $10 million loan guarantee. Uh, what you, the justification is humanitarian. It's a great humanitarian enterprise, and obviously we're big humanitarians, so we'll therefore give Israel the loan guarantees. Of course, we'll condition it on the, uh, we'll require that uh, they not use it for settling uh, Russian immigrants in the West Bank, which means we're telling them uh, use another dollar, not the one we're giving you for settling Russian immigrants in the West Bank and everybody will be happy with that. Uh, there's no debate in the United States as to whether it is a humanitarian effort. Again, if you go to the Israeli press, they point out openly, you know, there's nothing humanitarian about this. Uh, what's, what's in fact happening, uh, if, if it is true that Soviet Jews face a legitimate fear of persecution, let's say that's true, then they qualify for entry into the United States under U.S. immigration laws. Uh, of course, the U.S. won't let them in because Israel doesn't want us to, and we don't want them to either. We want them to be forced to go to Israel. Uh, this is quite open inside Israel. So, for example, the uh, Minister of Immigration, Michael Kleiner, uh, has an article in the, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, in the Hebrew press in Israel, in which he, he says he's going to Germany uh, because they've got a big problem in Germany now. The Germans are letting Russian Jews in, and he's got to go there and stop them from this, you know, anti-Semitic action. Uh, and he describes how he's going to do it. Uh, he's going to tell them, uh, here's roughly almost literal translation, he's, he's going to tell the Germans that they've already fulfilled their quota with regard to discrimination concerning Jews in this century, and they should start treating Jews just like other people at last. Uh, now, they don't let anybody else in, so therefore they shouldn't allow the Russian Jews in. So in short, because of the Holocaust, you know, uh, the Germans should stop discriminating with regard to Jews and not let Soviet Jews in, so they'll be forced to go to Israel. Well, there's nothing humanitarian about that. I mean, maybe you decide to do it or you decide not to do it, but it's humanitarian issue is zero. There's no humanitarian reason for forcing Russian Jews to go to Israel. And if you're thinking about problems of refugees, there are plenty of them. 
So for example, right across the river, there's hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees who are being driven out of Kuwait with the authorization of President Bush, who makes you know, various apologetics for it, which are featured in the Kuwaiti press. Uh, they're, be, they're not leaving because they're under fear of persecution. They're being tortured and driven out and so on. They're going into a very impoverished country, uh, no, not getting any aid. So you know, right next door, there's a much bigger humanitarian problem. And one can think of a number of others without too much imagination. Uh, so the, uh, the, pretense, the pretext that will be used is humanitarian. And there won't be any debate about that because it serves US interests. It serves US interests of trying to uh, extend Israeli control over the territories. That's the standard interest served by this. So therefore, we force Russian Jews to Israel, and the American taxpayer pays for it. That's the way it'll be presented. I'm mean, sorry, presented that way, but that's what it amounts to. Yes. Um, I'd like to come back to Latin America and the US support of democracy down there. Um, in December of last year, the much touted democratic elections were held in Haiti, and the US got a kick in the teeth uh, a few weeks before with Aristide's appearance on the scene. And um, also since December 90, when he was elected, there's been a big change in the tone of the reporting in the US press about Aristide um, between then and the coup on the 30th of September. What I'd like to ask is, um, do you have any comments on the events up till now in Haiti? And what do you see in US policy in the future there, in the immediate future? And how important do you consider the US public stance on democracy that has been such a big deal generally and specifically in Haiti yeah. recently versus uh, US interests down yeah. there? Well, uh, it's no, there's no question that the US was not happy with Aristide and would have much rather seen a standard representative of business interests. However, uh, the US accepted the Aristide government and in fact was even you know, more or less favorable to it. Uh, now, I think the reasons are basically two. First of all, Haiti is considered so hopeless, you know, that it's assumed that, you know, we can get some guy in there who has, who supports the poor and is, you know, interested in liberation. He's not going to be able to do anything anyway. The constraints are so narrow, you know, the economic situation is so horrifying uh, that the limits on any choices he can make probably won't make any difference. So therefore, we can tolerate him. Uh, furthermore, the US has just made a big rhetorical story about supporting democracy in the new world order and all that kind of stuff. And it's a little, you know, it's a, you know, po propaganda is a possible, you know, there's a lot you can do, but some things are tough. It would be tough to, you know, to oppose uh, what's obviously a popularly elected government too blatantly. Now, after the coup, uh, the US kind of was standoffish about it. You remember right after the military coup that threw out Aristide, there came a lot of reporting and talk about his terrible human rights record, and he's not a real Democrat, and all that kind of stuff. Actually, his human rights record is stellar as compared with anything before or after, or anything the US supports. Uh, but, and the US kind of reluctantly went along with the OAS boycott. And I suppose the reasons are pretty much the same. There's no real gain. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the US would much prefer uh, to have um, a standard representative of the, you know, the industrialists and uh, uh, the guys who are getting the good press in the yeah. press, you know, yeah, the ones who are called the Democrats, meaning the industrialists and so on. Uh, but it's not so simple to see how to do that. And since Haiti is not really considered very important because the options there are so restricted, I suspect the U.S. will continue to sort of stand back try to manipulate things so that the business classes and maybe the military restore control, maybe with Aristide as some kind of figurehead. And then we have to we'll laud ourselves again on our great contributions to democracy. That's what I suspect would probably come out. Frankly, I think for the US, it's kind of a minor issue. Uh, there, there's big humanitarian issues. For example, these thousands of people fleeing, the boat people. Uh, a couple hundred of them died the other day. Who knows how many hundreds or thousands are dying. But remember, this has been going on for 20 years. I mean, I'm sure you know. The, uh, there have been people fleeing from Haiti and the Dominican Republic for decades. And they, they drown at sea. Or uh, you know, if the Coast Guard picks them up, they send them back. And uh, 
um, and that's a really human rights horror, which has been going on for a long time. It's hitting the newspapers now, but it's not really new. Well, it has increased in the last It's increased few because of the coup, yeah. but sure. But it's been going on for a long time. So you, you and back in the late 1970s, it was already quite substantial. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of people, both from Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So you think from the point of view of the US rhetoric on democracy that it will just eventually sort of fade into the background, they'll try to make everybody forget about it? I mean, I realize Haiti isn't that important, but... Yeah, I mean, you've got to maintain the rhetorical stance. You know, we've got to maintain the rhetorical stance of being in favor of democracy. We've got a problem. Remember, there's a problem with the rascal multitude in the United States, too. They have to be subjected to illusions uh, about the U.S. commitment to freedom and human rights and democracy and so on. The commissar culture has its own tasks, and you don't want to make those tasks too hard, you know, like blatant support for a brutal military dictatorship. That's why, for example, when the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein in putting down the Kurds and the Shiites, there was a little bit of a propaganda problem, as you remember. We had to bring in all this business about stability and so on, and then quickly turn to another diplomatic triumph. I mean, these are constant problems in controlling populations. And since Haiti's kind of marginal, you know, they probably figure they can tolerate the appearance of democracy there. Um, I was wondering if, uh, since you're, talk you're talking about the New World Order, if you can make some comments on about the United States' attempts to isolate and demonize North Korea. North Korea. North Korea, considering um, what's going on now in the papers, because aside from the Middle East peace talks, what has been in the papers recently is the whole North Korea nuclear campaign, as well as um, officials coming out with statements saying that you know aggressive force must be used to contain North Korea. Also, that if um, Desert Storm was any indication, there'd be greater force used in in Korea. And so, if you can make some comment about that situation, taking into consideration of the U.S. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, you recall when after the Gulf War, Colin Powell made some statement about saying there's still a couple of things that haven't been resolved, like Cuba and North Korea uh, and Libya and a few others, which have to be integrated into the... I mean, the U.S. system is supposed to be a world system. That's always been the position. Uh, 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 certain pieces of it are still not integrated into it. Uh, North Korea is one of them. Um, it was kind of an interesting column the other day in the Wall Street Journal, which may be noticed from South Korea reporting that the South Koreans uh, want U.S. forces to remain even after possible unification with North Korea because they're afraid of Japan, you know. Uh, interesting sidelight on this. They have some history on that issue, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, th I, I don't really expect the United States to do anything serious to go after North Korea. It's too, it's too dangerous, too far away, you know. It's not the kind of thing you can do. A more likely target of U.S attack. In fact, the most likely one is Cuba. Uh, Libya, you can always just bomb at will. You know, that's not a big problem. You bomb them whenever you want a punching bag around. Cuba will take a little more work, uh, and it's the next most likely target. And, you know, the, you can see the mechanisms. Uh, Cuba was, has been under U.S. terrorist attack for 30 years. The Kennedy administration launched the world's by far the world's largest terrorist operation, international terrorist operation against Cuba right after the Bay of Pigs. And that went on for a long time, may still be going on. We usually learn about these things a couple of years later. Uh, they're under illegal embargo and economic strangulation. The United States has intimidated Latin America enough so they're not gonna break the embargo. And the European countries and Japan don't care that much. They're not gonna get in the way of the United States. So these, they were able to survive for a while by uh, assistance from uh, the East Bloc, but now that we have Gorbachev's new thinking, as it's called, meaning subordination to U.S. power, that wonderful thing, uh, they've stopped giving them sustenance, sustenance. So now you can continue the economic strangulation, assumption being that that'll worsen the internal situation enough so that there'll be, you know, protests and dissidents, and that'll intensify the repression, which is already severe enough and that'll cause an internal breakdown. And sooner or later, it'll get to the point where things have gotten so bad that you can send the Marines in with being pretty secure that nobody's gonna shoot back and you can call them liberation. Uh, that's probably the scenario. Uh, and if 
you know, the economy really is in trouble, that might be accelerated so as to happen before the next election. That's not inconceivable. But that's what I'd guess the next likely one is. North Korea, I think, is going to be just something to talk about for a while. So you think it's just a media campaign that there isn't well, any threat, you know, despite look, not, all these... I, I mean, they want to integrate North Korea into the U.S.-dominated system, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a big in it policy initiative for the U.S. For one thing, if North Korea did get absorbed into the Western-dominated economic system, Japan would be the main beneficiary, not the United States, okay, because that's in the Japan sphere of influence. And the U.S. has no particular interest in strengthening Japan. Actually, you can see this going on in Eastern Europe right now. Throughout the decade, the United States has been kind of trying to retard the opening up of the Soviet Union. In fact, right now, that's continuing. The U.S. is still, to this day, you know, is trying to strengthen the central forces in the Soviet Union against the separatist tendencies of the republics. I mean, just last August, Bush called, for, called on the Ukrainians not to move towards independence, you know. And in fact, throughout the decade, the U.S. has been opposed to trade with the Soviet Union, which would have led to more rapid liberalization and opening up and so on. Uh, the U.S. would prefer to see some kind of iron fist over there rather than opening the region up and turning it back into conventional third world. And I think that's not hard to understand. Uh, simply ask yourself, who's going to be the beneficiary of returning Eastern Europe to its traditional quasi-colonial status, which is what's happening. Well, the beneficiary is going to be mostly Germany and, and its surroundings, and Japan, if they decide to get in on the act. Those are the cap First of all, they're nearby. That's where the traditional trade patterns are. They have excess capital to invest, which the U.S. doesn't have. Uh, so the U.S. is kind of likely to be left out in the cold in that one. As a result, there's no special interest in it. Uh, and I think probably the same is true with regard to North Korea. It's my guess, anyway. Um, we only have time for five more questions, and please limit it to one sure. question each. My question is about the relationship between the Israeli government and the U.S. government. Uh, my first question is, um, there are a lot of talks after the Gulf War. About the... There are a lot of talks in the Middle East, especially after the Gulf War, especially in Israel, that Israel is uh, no longer an asset for U.S. interest, but rather a liability. And that's why they believe that the so-called powerful IPAC and other Israeli interests in Washington, D.C. are no longer powerful. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for your patience. And we apologize for those of you who were unable to get seats. And we apologize for those of you who weren't even able to make it in. The lecture will be broadcast on WPFW. And it will also be broadcast on C-SPAN. Uh, I need to mention that there's no eating, drinking, or smoking. Uh, you may smoke out in the hall, however, and if you have a stamp, then you can do that. Um, and first of all, on behalf of the Progressive Student Union, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture. The Progressive Student Union is a multi-issue organization that has been on campus for 11 years. We work on peace and social justice issues, and we emphasize connecting the issues. The Progressive Student Union, as a member of the Progressive Student Network, has the motto of study and struggle. And we think that's precisely what we'd like people to emphasize today. I'd also like to thank a few people and a few organizations who were central to making this event possible. The Georgetown Progressive Student Union and the Washington Peace Center. And please, if you have any time or money, the Washington Peace Center is an organization that's been in Washington, D.C. for almost 28 years. And they have a letter called the Peace Letter, which has all the essential of events, political happenings going on in Washington, D.C. And they've been absolutely pivotal to organizing the many demonstrations that have gone on since their founding. 
I'd also like to thank the Institute for Policy Studies, who, in addition to the Peace Center and the groups mentioned, um, did some promotional work for us and has been very helpful. Finally, and last but not least, I'd like to thank Mark Pavlik, whose uh, enduring efforts to make this event possible um, have really set an example for activists to follow. Uh, the other endorsing organizations that I will name off briefly are the Asia Resource Center, the American University Peace Studies Program, the Georgetown University Palestine Club, DC CISPIS, NISQA, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Guatemala Health Rights Support Network, excuse me, Guatemala Health Rights Support Project, the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, Bix Books, Vertigo Books, Middle East Research Information Project, Young Koreans United, and the Korea Resource Information Center. And all these people have literature and tables outside in the hall, and if you haven't looked at them already, please take a minute. Please take a minute to examine the uh, books from Bix Vertigo and the South End Press table, which is being staffed by Mr. Pavlik. Uh, some of the announcements. On December 5th, the Progressive Student Union will be hosting an event, a panel discussion on Iran-Contra, BCCI, and the October Surprise, connecting all these to Danny Casalero. The, some of the people on the panel will be Jack Calhoun, the Washington correspondent for The Guardian, Bill Hamilton and Nancy Hamilton, who are the owners of a computer software company, which has a very interesting legal history, and Michael Parenti, a, a well-known political scientist. Uh, Washington, D.C. activists will be gathering for a social on December 6th, and there's information about that available at the Progressive Student Union table out by the elevators. On December 4th, the Progressive Student Union is hosting a movie called Maria's Story, and that's uh, going to be at 7.30, and there's flyers and more information about that available. I have an event from, uh, an announcement from Jewish Committee on the Middle East, uh, that copies of Professor Chomsky's talk today are going to be available through the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, JCOM uh, is the acronym. Dr. Chomsky is on JCOM's advisory committee, as are the Jewish professors at over 150 universities all over the country who support the Palestinian right to statehood and major changes in U.S. Middle East policy. VHS copies will be $20, audio cassettes will be $10, and transcripts will be $3. And uh, there'll be more information about that available. And you'll find a flyer on the way out, and please take a minute to examine that. Um, I have an announcement from Guatemala. Human rights conditions have worsened in Guatemala throughout 1991. Seven human rights monitors have been killed in the past year alone. Between January and June, 371 Guatemalans have been murdered. NISQA, the Network in Solidarity with the People of Guatemala, urges everyone at this event to sign the human rights petition and NISQA will present it today to have Noam Chomsky of MIT here to offer his unique and penetrating analysis of the true nature of the New World Order. His work has ranged from groundbreaking research in the area of linguistics to a variety of books, including Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Media, Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, The Culture of Terrorism, and two volumes on the political economy of human rights, and many others. He has combined his fearless criticism of U.S. foreign policy with a role as a tireless activist, working with organizations such as the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and the War Resisters League. He has written for numerous publications such as Lies of Our Times and Z Magazine. We in the Progressive Student Union hope today's inquiry will inspire you to become involved with any of the important organizations addressing the terrifying reality of American foreign policy. Please help me in welcoming Noam Chomsky. The first struggle today is going to be the struggle against the heat of those television lights. In fact, uh, I'll start believing in the miracles of Japanese technology when they figure out a way to uh, televise without roasting the person who's standing up in front. Uh, the, uh, the announced topic was the New World Order, Central America, and the Middle East, uh, which touches quite a few 
bases. Uh, and the title like that leaves essentially two options. Uh, one option is to speak in general terms about the new world order, which as far as I'm aware is the old world order uh, adapted to changing contingencies as happens all the time. The most important of these change in contingencies have, have, having been about 20 years ago when the post-war uh, international economic system essentially was torn apart and has been reconstructed. Uh, a second option would be to pick some crucial issues, some particular topics, and to use them to illustrate the way the, uh, the general contours of the new world order, and that means the old world order. Uh, and it, thinking about it, it seemed to me that the second tack might be more informative and in fact, almost any and talking about standards of where we go, and that's how I would set up a Democratic candidate. Doug Bailey. I don't know whether it's a wish uh, or a prediction. I'm sure it's the former. Uh, I hope it's both. Uh, the winner will be the candidate, if there is only one, who defines what America can and should be in the year <coughs> 2000 and asks for a mandate to get there. That's called leadership. That's what the job is all about, and I think the public knows that. That's it? Yes. That's it? <laughs> That's truth? That's 30 seconds worth. That's all you need. <laughs> God, unbelievable. Well, we've had more than 30 seconds tonight, um, and I want to thank all of the panelists very much for giving the, us the benefit of their wise counsel. Uh, I'm Chris Arditon, a Dean of the Graduate School of Political Management, and I thank you all for coming. For more information on this event, write to the George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management at T409 Academic Center, at 801 22nd Street Northwest, here in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20052. Coming up next, a speech by MIT professor Noam Chomsky. Monday morning, Roger Simon, columnist with the Baltimore Sun, and M. Stanton Evans, syndicated columnist, are the guests on our Events in the News call-in program. They'll discuss weekend developments in the news and take your calls on a variety of topics. Monday, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up next on C-SPAN, a lecture and discussion by Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He delivered the lecture on Saturday focusing on the New World Order and its impact on Central America and the Middle East. To the Guatemalan government, see ni to sign on. Finally, one announcement from Young Koreans United. They are selling pens bought by a number of uh, labor unions in South Korea to raise funds to cover expenses for their trial. Uh, the workers have been fighting for three years to get their get back their wages and severance pay for products, which is uh, uh, products from a U.S. company. Please help the union in their historical fight. This is the first time a third world labor union is taking a multinational corporation to trial. Uh, following the talk, there will be a question and answer period. We ask that you please line up behind the microphone at the, in, in the aisle and that you keep your questions brief and precise. Finally, by way of an introduction, I'd just like to offer a few comments. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that some of the most basic questions about foreign policy are the most important and yet they're rarely addressed. Today we'll look at the New World Order and explore the disturbing answers to some of these questions. In a speech titled, The Challenge of Building Peace, delivered before the United Nations General Assembly on September 23rd, George Bush said the following, the new world order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. 
This order gains its mission and shape not from shared interests, but from shared ideals. And the ideals that have spawned new freedoms throughout the world have received their boldest and clearest expression in our great country, the United States. Never before has the world looked more to the American example. Never before have so many millions drawn hope from the American idea. And the reason is simple. Unlike any other nation in the world, as Americans we enjoy profound and mysterious bonds of affection and idealism. We feel our deep connections to community, to families, to our faiths. But what defines this nation? What makes us America is not our ties to a piece of territory or bonds of blood. What makes us America is our allegiance to the idea that all people everywhere must be free. The New World Order's prescription for freedom is clearly a blueprint for intervention. The New Republic in a recent cover story defined the fundamental law of the New World Order as follows. When the existing international rules, of, rules conflict with basic American values, to hell with the rules. And the corollary, the New World Order should be an assertion of American interests and values in the world, if necessary, asserted unilaterally. Where possible, we should act in concert with others. Where not, we should proceed anyway. We are very fortunate.